Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Many of us have heard of Heath Kit before, but have you heard of Heath Built before? Today we're going to take a look inside a Heath Built voltage reference standard. We'll take a look at its design, we'll get an idea of what the engineers were thinking when they put this thing together, we'll look at its regulation aspect, there's a whole bunch of neat things we're going to take a look at in this video. And I'll also show you a comparison between a modern capacitor and one of the dye film capacitors that are in this unit here. So lots of really interesting stuff coming, so let's get started. Let's take a look at what we're up against today. So I'm normally used to hearing Heath Kit, not Heath Built. So this is kind of a neat device, and this was part of a science thing that they had going on back in the 60s. This was sold as part of a package, almost, um, I guess, an entire setup they would sell with this and available to universities and things like that. Now, it's in very good condition, so it looks like it's been you know, kept well. Now, when I got this, you know, there's screws missing out of this, and I'll show you in the bottom here. It looks like there's a bag taped on the inside, and the bag looks very familiar. We used to have an electronic supplier here, which is now shut down like many of them, and uh, they use those bags. So uh, I'll take a look at that here in just a moment. So everything seems to work, you know, I guess you could say function in that manner except this side here, both of the knobs are really badly cracked. This one here, I don't know if you can see that, it's just really badly cracked. And that's just, you can see I can actually part that. I want to be careful because I'm going to put super glue on these. The smart thing for Heath Built or Heath Kit to do back in the day would have been to put a metal collar in there, like most of them have a, a brass collar in there that's threaded. And that would have kept things nice and tight on here, and there would have been no cracking. But since this switch, as you can hear, you know, takes quite a bit to turn. And I can't even turn it with my fingers, right? You heard one click there. Since it's, you know, takes quite a bit, you have to put quite a bit of pressure with this little set screw. And of course, that just cracks everything, as you can see here. It's just about ready to split in half. So I'm not going to do anything more with this. I'm going to super glue this and then clamp this and hopefully that'll take so i've got this really strong super glue and it's the same for this one now this one here is just a potentiometer inside but as you can see it just keeps on turning and there is some cracks in this one as well so i'll remove that one here and uh, that one's quite a bit tighter than this one this one's basically just falling off and i'll put some glue on those so these ones haven't cracked oddly enough so you know these ones here are both on these switches that have a somewhat of a ratchet inside and they're still okay so this one here would be moved a lot so of course this is the on and off so this is turned on and off every time you use it so you know i guess this would you know make sense that this one here would be the one that was broken first so the terminals on the top you have signal terminals and output terminals and basically what you would do with this is you would use this thing as uh, just a voltage reference. So if you wanted to align a voltmeter or something like that, you could set this all up and you would have a very precise voltage source that you could align your meters to. So a handy little tool to have around. There's a bunch of other things you can do with this as well. But, um, you know, that would be the primary use for something like this. Calibration, right? So, because it is a reference. So looking at the sides here, you can see the screws are missing. And on the back side, it's in very nice condition. Somebody looks like they may have replaced the line cord at some time. I see a tie strap inside there. You can see some regulator tubes inside. And on the bottom, you see there's screws holding it together on the bottom. And there's that bag that I recognize. That looks like an active components bag. You had these red bands on each side with that kind of telltale window happening in there. So we'll see if that's right. So we'll open this thing together and discover what's wrong with this thing and even if there is anything wrong with it and uh, make the thing work. Bring it back to life again. So there's a lot of really neat things to, to learn looking in something like this. You get to see how the engineers were thinking when they designed this stuff and we'll go over all that and um, analyze what the engineers did. We'll see if they did a good job or not. So I'll go get a screwdriver and get the bottom off this thing, take a look inside. All right, let's remove the bottom together and see what's inside this. So I was never a really big fan of these 
slot type screws because it's so incredibly easy to slip with a screwdriver and just run the screwdriver right across the case. Don't ask how I know this. So I've always been a fan of the Phillips or up here we have a screwdriver and a screw called the Robertson. So for those of you that haven't heard about the Robertson screw, you might want to read up on the history. It's kind of interesting and funny at the same time. I'll put this off to the side here. Okay, here we go. Let's take a look at what's inside this thing. Oh, not bad. It's looking like it's very well put together. And look at that. There's that active bag. Power MOSFET. And channel, what's in there? Those are some pretty screwy looking MOSFETs. But I bet you they've got a really low on resistance. Okay, I'll stop. All right, so get that out of the way. So what I'm gonna do is I'll reposition the camera here and I'll get in a little bit closer with some nice light on this and we'll take a look around inside. So the person that put this together did a really nice job. And of course this is Heath built, so it's built at Heath. That's most likely why. And of course, excluding the line cord here that's kind of poking through inside. This Aerovox capacitor is going to be very electrically leaky and it is going to have to go. Now, whenever you see a spray capacitor like this with red writing on it, these are known as dye film capacitors, and they're still good. So to this day, they exhibit low leakage. Now, on the other hand, if you come across one of these capacitors, they look exactly the same as this, except they have yellow writing. If you find spray capacitors like this with yellow writing on them, they are very, very bad because they are paper and foil. And it's advisable, if you find some of those in any device, it's not advisable to even power the thing up. All right, don't even try to power it up if those caps are in there because a lot of those are shorted by now and they'll cause a lot more problems. Now, it's very tempting. A lot of people do that. You know, they buy an old radio or an old piece of test gear and they just want to see if, say, the screen of the scope lights up or they want to see if it makes any crackling noises. Well, the crackling noises might be coming from under the paper here, and that is not a good thing, especially if these go away. So you got to be very careful. So red is good. Yellow is bad with these spray capacitors. And we'll test this one here in a little bit and we'll make sure that it is okay, because there always is exceptions. Diode in here, fuse holder. It looks like something's been trimmed out of here. See that? So I'll have to look into that. I'll look through my files here in a little bit and see if I can find a schematic that will closely match this device nice transformer very nice condition nice to know that it is not a charcoal briquette a lot of the times what happens is people don't replace these capacitors that one right in the back there and this one right here and when you're going to get your coffee or whatever and you're letting the thing warm up because this will have to warm up to stabilize when you come back, these holes on the back are not venting heat, they're venting smoke. So that's a, a very important thing. You got to get rid of those electrolytics. A lot of people talk about, oh, I just like to reform them. You know what? Electrolytic capacitors nowadays are so incredibly cheap. Don't risk the device to try and reform an old capacitor. Just get rid of the thing. So electrolytics very important. Now it tells me that this thing has very low mileage, or if you're in Canada or the UK, low kilometers is that this little vent hole here is not broken. It's usually split and they're usually leaking, usually leak a white substance out of them, right? It's an electrolytic capacitor, so we know what that stuff is. And it usually gets all over everything and causes corrosion issues and things like that. But this one here has not burst, which is very odd for a capacitor of this era. Now, because this was used basically for teaching and it probably was turned on, oh, not a whole lot of times, which might not be so telltale by this horribly cracked knob here, but those capacitors, they actually look like they're doing okay. But we are not going to take any chances. We're definitely going to get rid of those capacitors and make sure that no damage happens inside this thing. Again, it's not worth you know burning out a transformer or something like that. Now, the thing is fused very well. So there's 132nd amp fuse there and a half amp slow blow. So this is most likely going to be the, for the line. Yes, it is. Goes right off the line cord there. Interesting that they would run the neutral lead into the fuse. So usually the first thing in the hotline is the fuse. 
here in North America, the hot line is black. So that should definitely be reversed. Whoever put this line cord in must have not known that. On the switch over here, we can see the nice 400 ohm precision resistors, 1%. You see that there? Light isn't so great right there, but see that? 1%. And all the wafer switches look like they're in very nice condition. So they do have a nice little skim coat of oil on them. And that is always advisable in a situation like this because it stops them from tarnishing or oxidizing. And as you can see, this one here is in very nice condition, especially for this age, right? This is 1960s era stuff. So all in all, this is looking like it's in pretty good condition. So what I'm going to go do is try and dig up a schematic. Oh, we should also take a look at the regulator tubes here, too. I'm going to go dig up a schematic for this, and we'll follow along inside here. So this is a 0B2, made in France. So these are regulator tubes, gas-type regulator tubes. And you can look at them if you're you know, into modern-day stuff. They're basically vacuum tube versions of Zener diodes, or Zener diodes, if you prefer. So we'll talk a little bit more about those here in just a little bit when I grab the schematic. We'll see how they've put them in circuit and talk a little bit about their design. And we'll analyze their design, see what the engineers were thinking when they put this cute little reference together. I found a schematic that closely resembles what we're looking at. So let's take a look at the design. And so far, I can tell you, it looks sound. It's a nice, simple design for a reference. And it will definitely require some warm-up time to be anywhere near accurate, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a bit. So first of all, we'll start at the plug-in. We'll work that way. So we have a two-prong plug here, and as we know, somebody's replaced that with a three-prong plug. Power transformer, and you can see there's a, a dotted line in the transformer with a little ground symbol here. That just means that there's a shield inside the transformer. So it's a nice transformer design. Now you can see on the second side here, we have two diodes in series, and this is a half wave rectification setup here. The reason that they've put two diodes in series is, well, because of the technology in the day. And this is to do with PIV, so they don't want the diodes to break down in short. So to make the unit more dependable, what they've done to up the PIV really is basically put two of them in series. And that's what they've done here. So if I was to replace this nowadays, I could just replace this with one diode. There's absolutely no reason nowadays to have two there. So if you ever come across one of these units and you're thinking, oh, I should put two diodes in series. If you get a modern diode, you know, of the appropriate rating, you can just replace both of these with one diode. Filter capacitor right here, 70 microfarad, 350 volts. This is one of those ones that's going to have to be replaced. So these are the 0B2s, and as you can see, it says test point A and test point B over here, and those are those, what, if you recall earlier, there was something that was trimmed out. Well, there's little jumpers there that have been trimmed out, it looks to be. So what this is to do is to put a current meter across here so that you can do the alignment. Now, these regulators here are in a shunt regulator configuration, and what they've done is they've taken two of these and they've put these in series again. Now, 0B2, uh, if I recall correctly, is 105 volts. So depending on the current, usually, you know, if they're driven hard, they're a little higher. So maybe 107, something like that. I commonly find this, okay? So 0B2 and a 0B2 technically should be like about, you know, 210. All right, 210 volts at this point in a shunt regulator configuration. So, but usually they're, you know, between 210 and 215 somewhere. And uh, commonly they're about 107 each, something like that. So I would say this is going to probably come in close to 214. We'll see if my guess is correct. This is from years of working with these gas type regulator tubes. These are very commonly found in variable frequency oscillators and a lot of ham gear and tons of test equipment. And they very commonly glow orange as well very commonly and then of course the oa2 glows a powder blue color so now of course different gases and whatever it all depends on what they've put in the tube at that time and how they built the tube so now as you can see here it says vr tube current adjust and they 
have an arrow pointing at a fixed resistor instead of the variable resistor. Maybe a typo there, maybe that was supposed to point down here. At any rate, this is the adjustment. So the voltage regulator current adjustment would be right here. So by moving this VR back and forth would adjust the operating current of both of these regulators. Now you can see here, it says Zener, or Zener if you prefer, current adjust, again pointing at a fixed resistor, not the variable. So this is going to adjust the current right here, and of course you'd be measuring that across this point. So you would remove the jumper and you would be measuring the current because again, this Zener diode is in a shunt configuration. So these are shunt regulators right here. Now you can see we have a calibrate control here, and this is a 110 volt one watt Zener diode. Now in order for this thing to operate correctly, this is a 100 volt maximum uh, reference. Okay, so what they've done is they're using a 110 volt, one watt Zener diode, and when the thing is stabilized, you would adjust this to have exactly 100 volts at this point right here, and of course that would carry through to the output. If they used a 100 volt Zener diode here, you know, chances are it might settle off at 95 or 98 and you wouldn't have the range. So it's always better to go over you know, 105 volt or a, you know, a 110 volt Zener diode and then adjust the variable resistor and you know, bring it to the area that it needs to be. So there is going to be quite a bit of interlock between all three of these adjustments right here. So adjusting one is going to bring the adjustments over here out because if you move the current of this, it's going to shift over here and it's going to shift everything. So all three of these are going to be a very interesting adjustment. We're going to have to have basically monitor all three. So we'll have to monitor A, B, and we'll also have to monitor the output as we're adjusting everything because everything is going to move together. So we'll have to go back and forth and adjust a whole bunch of things here. Looks like that's going to be how things go. So that's called interlock. So there's going to be a lot of interlock between these three adjustments and that's just the way the thing is built now another thing that's going to make this thing very touchy is a lot of people don't know this and if you're designing power supplies and you're using zener diodes they're very temperature sensitive especially if you want anything accurate and i mean temperature sensitive so just placing your finger on this diode is going to cause movement in the voltage and especially and if there's any type of current across this. So I've yet to look up the current specs where they want this all set. So this is going to obviously be higher than the Zener, right? And the reason that they have two uh, regulation setups is what they're doing is they're regulating this at this point right here. So we have drop across this network right here. So we have this resistor here and this is in parallel with that and we adjust this to set the current up and measure the current at this point. So we're gonna pre-regulate this supply here and then we have one more step of regulation with a diode over here just to make things all that much more stable. Now, if this thing was built today, you would want something with some form of an error amplifier or something like that. And you could, you know, there's so many ways to make this much, much more stable. But for way back when, this, you know, really gets the point across using shunt regulators and everything. And again, this is going to have to sit for a while and everything is going to have to temperature stabilize. So I've designed many, many power supplies, working with Zener diodes, any type of temperature movement is going to cause a voltage shift. And we'll experiment with that. I'll give you some examples of this here in a little while. So we have a, the pilot light is across this resistor right here. So there's obviously enough drop across this and that would make sense because we're gonna have about 200 and, well, say 214, okay? Just guesses. 214 at this point right here. And then we had dropped that down to 110 over here. So there's enough drop across this network to light up a neon bulb. So that's why the pilot light is across there. They've done that. Down here, we have another filter capacitor right here just to keep things stable. Over here, we have this one microfarad capacitor, and that looks like that AeroVox capacitor that we looked at earlier, this one right here. Now, they have a reversing switch here, polarity reversing switch, and they have the capacitor on this side of the reversing switch, and this is most likely to keep things nice and quiet. Now, this here would have to be a non-polar capacitor. You can put electrolytic here because if you hit the reverse, of course, it's going to reverse the polarity of the capacitor. But if you had the capacitor on this side, the, you know, the, the polarity would always stay constant. 
but they're obviously doing this maybe to keep you know contacts and everything to keep everything as quiet as possible so this would definitely want to be some form of a poly style capacitor as a replacement this is the 132nd amp fuse here so if anything goes wrong or you draw too much current that thing is going to go away and the voltage divider here. So this is going to be feeding current through the voltage divider network right here. So it's going to take a little bit of current to drive this as well. And of course, if you're to move positions and this current was to change at all because of resistor variation or anything like that, it's going to load this differently. And of course, if we pull more load over here and things get easier on this Zener diode just a little bit, you know, it's going to, the temperature is going to lessen across the diode and it's going to cause a voltage shift. Very, very sensitive component to have in a circuit like this, even if you load this a little bit. So you add just a little bit of load over here and, you know, you know, you, you draw more load over here. You know, if anything changes over here, this is going to cause any, uh, you know, a movement in voltage. So we'll take a look at that here in just a moment. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get rid of these capacitors here. I'll replace this capacitor and this capacitor here, and we'll test some capacitors together. And we'll see if the thing comes to life. And then we'll try and do a calibration on it and see if we can get the thing to come within calibration. New capacitors are installed, and they're also away from heat-generating devices like those big resistors there. So they're behind the tube socket. That worked out really nice. I had to install a standoff. See a little standoff right there? It just threads on to the screw that's holding the transformer down. I had to install that standoff so I could get a wire over to the point to where the capacitor was before. I've added a new grommet on the back here. See this grommet? This is a vinyl grommet. This is aluminum, and aluminum takes super glue very well. So on the inside, I put the grommet into the hole, and on the inside, I put some super glue around the base of the grommet and then move the grommet around. And that makes a very, very solid connection between the grommet and the aluminum here. Yet, in the future, if I have to take it out, I can just get in there and pry it off, basically take it off the chassis here. And then what I did is I also put some super glue on the line cord itself. So put some super glue around the line cord right where it goes into the grommet and then I pull the line cord out just a little bit so the super glue goes into the center of the vinyl grommet and what that does is now the grommet is solid to the chassis and the line cord is solid in the grommet so I have a restraint and the reason that I want that you remember before there was just a tie strap around here and all of the cords can move well you want the cord to be very steady in here because it's tied to a very, very fragile point right here. And any type of movement or repetitive twisting can rip components off inside, can actually damage that switch. So this is very solid and this will never break. So that'll be in there for the life of the line cord. There's a strain relief here because when you're changing the fuse, this moves around. So there's a strain relief right here and then the ground goes to this point right here and there's a star washer under there and there's now a star washer on the back side as well to make sure that there's a lots of ground you'll notice that the other screws do not have star washers and this one does I want to make sure that the paint is definitely broken through and that I have a nice solid earth on the back side since I'm in here changing those caps I may as well just change them all out. So I put a brand new cap here. I removed the die film, one, a die film capacitor here. And uh, what we'll do is we'll test that here in just a moment. And I've also replaced this one microfarad with a brand new one here, which is also a film style capacitor. So at this point, it's pretty much ready to try out. All the switches and everything are nice and clean. So I've moved the selectors around. I've also put some glue in the knobs and it's been setting for quite some time now so I'm hoping that those little knobs will hold up not slip on the shaft another thing I should mention is whenever you have long runs of AC line cords it's always a good idea just to twist them together now yes of course the line cord here is you know the same so usually why they twist line cords together is to keep noise down, right? Well, this is on the same side, so this once the switch is closed, this is just one solid connection. 
The other reason I've twisted these is to keep them together and out of the way. Now, for some of you might be going, well, there's a black wire coming out of the transformer and you have a white wire going to... Both of the leads that come out of the transformer for the AC side are black. That's standard transformer wiring. So on the other side, the other lead will be black as well. So you can see, black lead here, black lead there. So the hot side is now fused. And I feel much more comfortable with the hot line fused. That's for sure. So now I just need to get the knobs back on the front here. Hopefully they're going to you know, take to the shaft okay. And then we'll attempt to do an alignment. Oh, and I'll also give you an example of the die film capacitor here. I'll compare a die film to a new one here, and I'll show you the differences over time. And then this is the die film one here that was removed. And this is the other capacitor. This one isn't even worth testing because it's just so bad. You know, sit here for a day and the, uh, the tester won't even go down. So I'll go get a new capacitor and I'll show you the difference between a die film capacitor and a brand new one. I went digging through my box of older capacitors just to find one of these yellow labeled sprags to show you. So these are the ones that are really, really bad. So if you find these in equipment, you definitely want to get rid of these things. Even if they're in audio amplifiers, these aren't even good to repurpose or anything. Right? So these are uh, very, very leaky by now. And here's one the same size. So this is a 600 volt rated part and this is a 600 volt rated part. And you can see that they're very similar. Both say sprag on them. It's just one's red and one's yellow. Yellow ones are always bad. I'm not even going to bother testing this because it's just, you know, we'll sit here forever waiting for the meter to read and nothing will happen. This is the one out of the, um, out of the reference. And you can see it's much smaller because it is a 400 volt rated part where this is a 600 volt rated part. So I'll get those out of the way. So we'll focus on these two here. So this is the replacement capacitor here. Now I've spent lots and lots of time verifying components and I've made lists up on Patreon. So if you think that you're going to benefit by having verified components, electrolytic capacitors and capacitors like this, you might want to check that out. Those are attachments up there. So there's a couple of different videos that I have with different types of verified components. I've spent a lot of time on doing some research. So what I'll do is I'll test this capacitor here and I'll give you an example of what a good capacitor is. So I'll first test this on the paper and poly position right here. And then what I'll do is I'll flip this down to the forecast position, which is the center position right here. And the LEDs should not count back up. All right. So what this is doing is this is looking for any trace you know, leakage resistance inside this little part right here. These are very good parts and you'll see that. Now, this will count down here in just a moment. So what happens is this device has to charge this up. So it takes a few moments to charge this up. And then you'll see this zip down and then that will go green indicating low leakage. You see how quickly that moves down. It's green. I'll click it onto forecast. Now this is testing this capacitor way, way, way up in the gig ohms. Looking for any trace resistance inside there, any type of leakage resistance at all. And as you can see, nothing happens, nothing moves. It just stays green, okay? So I'll shut this off and I'll do the same thing. So this is the same device. This is 0.1 microfarad and this is 0.1 microfarad. This is a, the older die film style capacitor. Now you'll see that it will pass this test just like the other one, okay? This will take a little bit longer to, to go down than this one here, all right? Because this is an older style capacitor. But nonetheless, you'll see that it does go down. This is testing this in the low gig ohms right now. So this is paper and poly. Same type of test. It takes a few moments. The more leakage resistance you have in a device, the longer it takes to charge, right? So now when this starts to count down, you'll see it counts down a little bit slower than the other one. All right, it'll come down to a green, indicating that it is low leakage. But now watch what happens when I click it on the forecast. You see it starts to count back up again. You'll notice that this one didn't do that. So that's indicating that there is, you know, trace leakage resistance inside this. And of course it's an older capacitor, right? But nonetheless, this capacitor here could still be used in audio service could still be used 
And, you know, of course, you know, it's going to pass just a little bit of DC. Just shut this off. You can see it stops right about there. It's actually going up still. Still counting up a little further. You get the idea at any rate. So, so this is going to pass a little bit of DC, right? And what it's going to do is add that DC to the bias of the next stage. It's actually going to bias it positive, right? Because it passes the plate. You know, the plate voltage from one side is going to end up on the other side because it's leaking direct current, right? And that changes the bias point of the next stage. And some musicians like that because it drives the next stage into heavier class A. So if it drives it into heavier class A, you know, class A, when you drive things into heavy class A, it actually makes things sound a little bit smoother. And that's that sound that musicians are looking for. And that's the reason I believe that they like these things. So again, you know, on the regular test, it's still okay. Just in the forecast position, we can tell that it's aged, you know, and it's, you know, definitely um, nowhere near the low leakage of a brand new capacitor right here, like the yellow one, right? So there's an example of new versus old. So this would still be fine in that circuit. This would still be fine in the tester that's just behind here right now. I could have left this in, but since I'm recapping it, I may as well put all brand new capacitors in there and this thing will be good for a long, long time. So again, can't tell you enough. You see yellow writing, it's got to go or you'll damage your equipment. Just remember that. So if you're interested in building one of these things, all the plans are up on Patreon to build these. So printed circuit board layouts are up there, the schematics alignment procedure, and all the additions and addendums to this device and everything that's been, you know, added as I've gone along here is all up there. All right, let's try this thing out and see if it works. So the AC is on right now, so I'll turn the meter on. And I'll turn this on to standard volts and we'll see what happens. So right now this is sitting at 90 and it'll be 90 plus 10. So that should be right at 100 volts right now. And as you can see, it's at 104.5 and it's moving a little bit and it's going to move for actually quite a while because that Zener diode or Zener diode, if you prefer, is going to get warm. And of course the associated circuitry as well. So this should adjust that down. And you can see. See, so that's where it should be sitting with this right up pointed right to the end, right to 10. So with it up here, it's a ways out. So now what we need to do is we need to align all this and I need to get a bunch of meters into the scene here and we'll adjust the Zener current and we'll adjust the regulator tube current and see how accurate we can make this. I have all the meters attached for the alignment. So this meter here monitors the tubes, so the current flowing through the regulator tubes. This is the Zener or Zener, whatever you prefer, current. And this is the output voltage over here. And I should make sure that I have this at 10. I do. Okay, here we go. Turn everything on. We'll see where we are. Let things settle for just a moment. So now what I need to do is bring this down to 100 volts and then I'm going to adjust the voltage regulator tube and the Zener. So I'll move this over here. You'll see how they all move when you just move one control. So you can see where this would get kind of time consuming. So this is at now 100 volts and this here should be at about two point, between 2.3 and 2.5. So I'm going to want to adjust the Zener current. So if I adjust that You'll see everything will move as well. Again, that interlock, I can get this into that little VR in there. So this is supposed to be between 2.3 and 2.5 milliamps, and the VR, the voltage regulator tube, is supposed to be between 15 and 17 milliamps. So right now we're kind of within that range, so 2.3 is where the Zener should be at the bottom. I'll set it to about 2.4. And this is 16 here. 
So this is right in the middle, and we're at 100.3, so we'll take that down to 100. Move that down to 100 carefully. Just leave that right there. It seems like it's right on the verge. So the voltage regulator, the actual tube, isn't too far off. So 16.3 is okay to leave. It's between 15 and 17. And this is at 2.3 right now. So 2.37. Now, the whole thing is with this is the Zener diode and everything in this needs to get up to temperature before the entire alignment really can be completed. And it's kind of hard to do that because you can't monitor the current of either with the case on. There are should be some monitoring jacks on the back with some jumpers or something that you could replace so that you could have the case all together and do the adjustments with everything together at you know when the thing is up to operating temperature you can see like this is going to keep moving around right here right right now the the zener is warming up so i'll give you an example of how sensitive it is what i'll do is i'll just move this and i'll just blow on the zener diode just to cool it off just a little bit. Okay. All right, so watch the meters as I just blow on the Zener diode. And it's only been on for just a little, you know, just a little bit at this point. So here we go. Look at that. Just from cooling it off, just like that. So now it'll warm back up again and Everything will all move. So you can see how incredibly sensitive this is. So technically what I need to do is I need to let this stabilize the best that I can. I'll just move this back over this way. I'll let this stabilize the best that I can with the case off. So I'll let this run for quite a while. And what I'll do is I'll adjust this. Just everything as close as I can get it. And then the only thing I can adjust after that point really is the calibration here because it doesn't require me to have any current meters attached inside the unit. Again, I can't get into the unit with the case on, right, with the, with the two current meters. So I'll set these as close as I can and then I'll adjust the actual, the calibration, which is sets the output right here. It's not doing too bad. Sitting at 2.2, it's supposed to be 2.3, right? It's creeping down, as you can see that. So right now, again, I can spend a few moments here and just bump this up. Take that to 2.4. And as it warms up, it'll creep down again. And you can see as I bump that up, now it changed the voltage here again, so I can move the calibration back down to 100. Point zero, or close to. And it's at 2.4, so... Yeah, it's between 15 and 17 on the other end. 16. I'd prefer it to be about 16.5. So I can move the VR tube up just a little bit. It's going to move at any rate. Leave that at 16.5. Take the calibration, take that, that back down to 100 volts again. And we're at 2.35, so I could probably bump that up to 2.4. And now that moved that to 16.3. I can bump the VR tube back up to about 16.5. dips in the line voltage here and everything. It's 2.4, right? You can see the line voltage came up here. You see how that would move it. And then I can just wait for everything to settle back down again. Move that back down to 100 volts. 16.5, 2.4, and 100 volts. 
and just leave that there. It'll probably creep up. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll just sit here and watch this for a while and keep adjusting these things and keeping it in an area. You can see it went down to 2.39 now. So I'll let everything settle here for quite a while. Let everything get up to temperature and stabilize and then I'll do a couple of final alignments and we'll see how close the dials are on this to what they're supposed to be after that point. It's been quite a while now and it looks like it's getting somewhat stable. So there's still, you can see a little bit of line variation. But that has nothing to do with this. It's just the line moving up and down affecting the numbers here a little bit. The 100 volts is staying pretty constant at this point. So let's take a look and see what those regulator tubes are at. So my guess was 214 before. Let's see. 213.5, not far off. So pretty, it's pretty standard for zero B twos. So not bad. It's coming together very well. I'm actually very pleased with this. So what I'm going to do is put the jumpers back in now and I'll put the case on and hopefully the knobs on the front are going to be in calibration. Of course, I'll let it warm up again before I come back and we take a look at that. The voltage reference source has been on for quite some time now and everything is stabilized. It took about two adjustments throughout the time that it's been on. It's been on for about 45 minutes now. So I'll give you an example. So we're at 90 plus 10 is 100 volts. So I'll move this down, 90 volts. Not bad for something from the 1960s. Very primitive regulation. So we'll go back up here. And this should be 95 volts here. So. Right there. 95 volts. Ninety six volts. Not bad. And it's like that throughout all the ranges. So I could spend a lot of time here just clicking through all the ranges, but you get the idea. So all in all, project successful. I'm very happy with this project. Worked out very, very well. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you are enjoying these videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be more videos like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at all sorts of different electronic devices, modern and antique alike. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. And if you want to be notified as soon as I post a new video, don't forget to tap that bell symbol. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way and gaining access to many of my personal designs and inventions, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the video's description and I'll also pin the link at the top of the comments section. So if you click on that link, it'll take you right there. The capacitor tester that you've seen in many of the videos and many of my other designs are all up there for you to build and enjoy. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.